All right, so we are in unit one of Humble Yourself, The Way to Greatness. Unit one is the mindset of Jesus. We have the greatest example of greatness. If you want to truly be great in God's sight, Jesus is the example of what that looks like. And so if we're going to follow his example, we need to understand his mindset, what motivated him, how he lived his life, how he went about doing things. And the opening scripture for this unit is have this mind, right? It's the mindset of Jesus. So Paul in Philippians 2 verses 5 and 6, it opens up, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours. In Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Wow. Jesus, God in the flesh, not using his authority, his power for his own exaltation, but to serve, to lower himself, to serve others and lay down his life so that others could come to know the Father. Hallelujah. What a beautiful example we have in Jesus. And so we're at point A. Point A is Jesus humbled himself. Okay, so he humbled himself. That's what this course is. Humble yourself. Well, Jesus, he set the example for that. He's not just saying, hey, you need to humble yourself. No, Jesus humbled himself. God in the flesh. I want you to get that. God in the flesh humbled himself. Hallelujah. It's so beautiful. So again, from Philippians chapter 2, a little broader passage now, starting with verse 3. Do nothing. This is Paul writing to the Philippians and guiding them, instructing them, talking to believers. This is also for you and for me, talking to us. If you say that you are a believer, you say you are a follower of Christ, this is for you. Paul says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This is the verse we just read. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Jesus had no ambition of or for his own will or his own reputation. What this says, he, unlike everyone else in this world, who is constantly functioning in selfish ambition and what's in it for me and looking out for their own interests or the interests of their family or the people connected to them so that they can succeed and they can advance and they can prosper. That is the opposite of the way of Jesus. Jesus had no ambition for forcing or causing his own will to come to pass or for building his own reputation in this world. Instead, he emptied himself. And the definition for that is there in your study guide. To make empty or to empty, to make void, to deprive of force or render vain, useless, or of no effect. So instead of trying to strengthen himself like, yeah, look at me how powerful I am, and then I'll use this to dominate over other people and domineer over them and lord over them. Well, it's kind of funny to say it this way, that way because, you know, Jesus is Lord. So if there was any ever anyone who could lord over people, it would be him right? That's what this is about. But he didn't lord over people. Instead, he made his flesh of no effect. So here's this Jesus 
Jesus, born of a virgin, born of a woman, with the nature of man. He is fully man, but he was born of God. The Holy Spirit came upon Mary, and she became pregnant with the Son of God. Jesus had the divine nature of God in him. And so he lived fully God and fully man at the same time. Hallelujah. But to empty himself instead of like every other person who has this nature of man, who's always exalting themselves, functioning from selfish ambition, trying to advance themselves, looking out for their own interests. Instead, Jesus rendered his flesh to be vain and void and of no effect. So in our new covenant context, we would say that's crucifying the flesh. Well, Jesus crucified his flesh before he ever went to the cross. He made his flesh null and void so that he could obey the divine nature of God. And that is our new covenant example. Jesus died on a cross, shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins so that we could be cleansed through the atonement and the forgiveness of our sins so that we could be a clean vessel. Why? So that after he ascended to heaven, he was raised from the dead on the third day, ascended into heaven, and then poured out the Holy Spirit so that everyone who believes in him has that same divine nature dwelling inside of us. The Holy Spirit comes that we might also participate with divine nature the same way that Jesus did that we have the opportunity to render our flesh null and void so as to function from divine nature and do what is pleasing to God. So Jesus emptied himself. We also can empty ourselves of our own ambitions, our own plans, our own desires, our own will and the desire to have a reputation before men and be esteemed by people in this world. We, like Jesus, can empty ourselves of our sinful and carnal desires so that our only desire is to please God. This is the mindset of Jesus who humbled himself. He took on the form of of a servant. And that word servant is also in your study guide. Now, some of you might be familiar with the the word servant that is uh, diakonos or diakonos, which is the word that we get the word deacon from. So deacon or servant. That word is the word that we would use also for a waiter. Like you go to a restaurant and there is a person that waits on you. They take your order. They bring your order out. Hopefully your order is correct. If your order is not correct, you send it back and it is the waiter's job to bring you what you asked for, right? So that kind of servant is one kind. This word is a whole deeper level than just a waiter servant. This word for servant is the same word for slave. A slave who is owned by another person who has lowered, is lowered into a place of service. Or This is from now starting from the definition. A slave, bondman, or a man of servile condition. A person in subjection or subserviency. One who gives themselves up to another's will. So when you're a slave, you don't have a will of your own. The master doesn't really care what your will is because it's not your place to have a will. As a slave, you give yourself up. You give yourself over. What the master wills is what you will. That's what this is. That's what Jesus did before God. Now, these are the types of terms that people in the world today, no one wants to talk about this. No one wants to lower themselves or humble themselves. They only want to be equipped and empowered and made powerful and raised up. Okay. But if you want to be raised up by God, then this is the posture you need to take. Have this mind among yourselves which is the mind 
of Christ Jesus. He, if Jesus took on the form of a slave and gave himself over to the will of the Father, how much more do you need to humble yourself and give yourself over to the will of God? The definition continues, one who is devoted to another, to the disregard of one's own interests. Okay, so that just eliminated all of you who think that obeying God is like a democracy or a, a conversation between equals. It is not. At one time, I also had thoughts like that. You know, I came out of a life I was not always a Christian. And when I first started following God, I knew the Holy Spirit had come in me and God was speaking to me. But at that point in time, and yes, I know those of you who are listening from all over the world and from different nations, I am American. And so when I was a baby believer, I still had a very American view about what it meant to obey God, meaning it's like a democracy. You know, you're God, I'm Wendy, you get a vote, I get a vote. That's how I treated it for a while. But God taught me better than that. I didn't know, but now I know. Being a servant of God, God is God. We are not equal with him. Jesus Christ was God, is God in the flesh, is equal with God the Father, except with limited knowledge in some areas. But even Jesus did not approach his father like, hey, pal, what, what do you think? Well, this is what I think we should do. Oh, you think that? Well, you know what? I think it's my will today. Let me offer my opinion about that. Let me offer my perspective about that. That's how I hear some of you talk, but that's not obedience to God. Obedience to God is total devotion to Him, giving yourself up to His will, to the disregard of your own interests. So let's look at some other scriptures that Jesus said about this and how He lived this way. John 5, verses 19, and then skipping to 30. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son, referring to himself, can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. So you see that Jesus limited himself. He didn't just do whatever he thought he should do. He didn't say like, well, I'm God. So like, I haven't heard from the Father yet today. So it must be that this is as well, because that's what come into my mind. No, that's how I hear some of you talk. That's not what Jesus said. He said, I can't do anything of my own accord. It's not about what I want. I have emptied myself. I have given myself over to the will of the Father. Whatever I see him doing, that is what I do. And verse 30, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Why? Because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And, you know, there are times when people can be very manipulative. Why do people manipulate? Because they're trying to bring about their own will or what they desire to see happen in any given situation. But Jesus didn't do any of that. He wasn't trying to force something to come to pass. He was totally submitted to the will of the Father. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is just. He wasn't here to judge anyone. He was here to save. He was here with a different mission. If he were to judge anyone, it would be just. Why? Because he heard from the Father. He had perfect spiritual discernment. But he wasn't trying to force or manipulate his own will to happen. The reason that his judgment was always perfect and right and true is because he never sought his own will, but he only sought the will of the Father who sent him. John 12, he says something similar. Verse 49, I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. So everything that Jesus said, everything that he taught, 
It was not his own idea. He was not just another rabbi who came up with some really great teachings and some interesting interpretation of Scripture. No, everything that he said, everything that he taught, he spoke because he had heard it from God. Verse 50, And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. And John 8, 28, So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father has taught me. So when Jesus uses the expression, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, he's actually making a biblical reference to a passage from Isaiah 53, which really it technically starts at the very last part of Isaiah 52. So I think it's actually in the last part of Isaiah 52. But Isaiah 53 is about the suffering servant. And he's saying, you know, that passage says that the servant will be high and lifted up. And then it describes this atrocious suffering suffering that this servant goes through to redeem and pour his life out, his soul out for atonement for the people, and then makes tr- uh, intercession for transgressors. So he's saying, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, he's saying, you are going to make me into that suffering servant. You are going to put me on a cross. I will be high and lifted up as the suffering servant when you crucify me on a cross. Now, why does that matter? Because what we just read, Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, meaning when you have put me on a cross and you're causing me to be the suffering servant, when you have put me on a cross and I am dying and shedding my blood, then you will know that I'm not here for my own selfish ambition. Why? Because nobody who's functioning in selfish ambition goes all the way to the point of death. And, and not denying that they are not who they claim to be. Jesus never denied who he was. He was the Son of God. He knew who he was. He was the Messiah of Israel. He obeyed God even unto death. But he said, that that's going to be the proof. See, you think I'm here trying to make a name for myself. You think I'm here the same way that in, in John 8, he's talking to Pharisees and, and he's kind of rebuking them somewhat harshly, actually, in later parts of the chapter. But he's kind of clarifying, you think I'm just like you. You think I'm here to make a name for myself. You think I'm here to advance myself and my own reputation. But you know what? When I'm dying on a cross, you're going to know that I'm not like you. And because no, none of you would do that. None of you would lay down your life for the people. So he's saying, when you put me on a cross and I die, then you will know that I'm not here out of selfish ambition. So continuing on, not only did Jesus make himself a slave of God, emptying himself of his own desires and his own agenda, but he used, he didn't use and abuse God's power and authority for himself and his own desires or his own exaltation or luxury or prosperity, but instead he used God's power and authority to do the will of God, to fulfill the agenda of God, which was and is to show mercy. The Lord, the Lord, compassionate, merciful, abounding in steadfast love and mercy, forgiving, right? This is the nature of God, to have compassion, to show mercy. This is the heart of God for people, especially the lost, the wounded, the hungry, the sick, the broken, the oppressed. Jesus came, and not only did he empty himself as a slave before God, but he gave himself over to people that if you were functioning in selfish ambition, you would never go after those people. You would never spend time with those people. But because of the mercy of God and Jesus giving himself over to the will of God to show that mercy, 
People were, fe- the lost were found. The broken were made whole. The sick were healed. The demon possessed were delivered and set free. The captives and the oppressed were set at liberty. This is the good news of the kingdom of God. This is the gospel. Good news to the humble. Good news to the poor. But Jesus described it this way. This is John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Okay, you're seeing how these scriptures, it's like Jesus, he's saying the same thing again and again, but these are all different verses. He's trying to make it abundantly clear. I'm not in this for myself. I'm in this for the Father. And not only, I'm not just doing my own idea of what the Father wants. I submit myself totally to him that my own will doesn't even get mixed into it. I am only here to do the will of him who sent me. The ministry of Jesus was so unexpected. It was so different from what people were thinking the ministry of Messiah was going to be. Even John the Baptist, John the Baptist had proclaimed, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And they were anticipating the arrival of Messiah to put all the Gentiles to shame, especially the Roman Empire who were controlling the world at that time and who had Israel, the people of God, Israel, under oppression. Israel was not an independent nation at that time. They were under the rule and the oppression of the Roman Empire. And so people anticipating by the scriptures and especially the book of Daniel, the calculation of the time frame of the arrival of the Messiah, they were anticipating a Messiah who would come as a warrior and who would destroy all those who were arrogant and proud and opposed to God. And we're going to talk about that day because that day will still come. It is still yet to come. But Jesus came the first time in the flesh to do the will of God by proclaiming good news to the poor, to pour his life out for the broken, to associate with tax collectors and prostitutes and people that selfishly ambitious people would never hang out with to associate with the poor who could never pay him back. People that if you're trying to make a name for yourself, you wouldn't hang out with them because there's no benefit in it for you. But it was so different. John the Baptist, was, he, he sent messengers when he was in prison and about to give his life. He believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He'd had an experience. He had seen the Holy Spirit descend from heaven like a dove and a light upon Jesus. He said and he proclaimed, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the Son of God. John, he knew he was bold. He was confident. But when it came time for him, he was about to be beheaded. He sent messengers because Jesus now, when John first saw Jesus at the baptism, he he expected Jesus. Jesus to be a different kind of Messiah than he turned out to be. And so when it came time for John to give his life, he wanted to be sure. So he sent these messengers to Jesus saying, um, hey man, are you, are you the one or is there somebody coming after you? Because your ministry, we've been watching you the way you do things. And this is like, uh, we thought you were going to like get some war going here. Like we thought you were going to do some demolishing and instead you're going around healing everybody and like hanging with people that are seem to be lawbreakers and enemies of God and Israel. So this is kind of confusing. So are, are you the one? Like we know there's something special about you, but like, are you the one or is there somebody else after you? And Jesus answered this way. He did not condemn John for his doubts. Instead, he answered this way, Matthew 11, starting with verse 4. And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. And the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up. And the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended 
by me. Hallelujah. So Jesus there is, again, it looks like he's just making a statement, but Jesus, you know, this is, I love this about him. He is the word made flesh. He is the word of God. He is the logos of God in the flesh. And so even in this passage, he is quoting from several Old Testament passages, particularly Isaiah 35, Isaiah 61. He's quoting from a few, and he's kind of mashing them all together because he's Jesus, so he can do that. But he's putting them together to quote to John, who would also know these scriptures by heart, that this is the description of the ministry of the Messiah. And so he's saying, this is what I'm here for. These are the works that I am doing, right? It was different than what was expected, but these were the works that Jesus was doing. And then he added this part, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. If you take offense that Jesus is not exalting himself or trampling on people or constantly focused on how he's going to prosper and make you awesome and do everything that you want. If that is offensive to you, that he instead lowers himself and humbles himself before God and before man to hang out with the poor, to heal the sick, to, to spend time with the broken and make them whole then blessed are you if you are not offended by that, because most people are offended by that. You know, I thought I was, I just so happened even just this morning to be in Walmart getting some, some stuff. And a man, he came up to me and he was clearly a homeless man or in some, some impoverished kind of state. And he came up and he asked me a question about something that he was looking for. And, you know, I answered him and I made friends with him. We had a nice little conversation. And I thought, you know, even in my, I won't put this on anybody else. I'll put this on myself and the person that I was before Jesus. The person that I was before Jesus and before God showed me the way of humbling myself before him and before others, I might have taken a look at that man and seen him as dangerous and walked away from him or not helped him. See, that's the way of this world. That's the way of someone who's looking out for their own interests. You know, you think, oh, well, if someone sees me talking to him, they might think that I'm like him. If someone sees me talking to him, they might, you know, maybe he's got a bad motive. Maybe he's going to steal something from me. Whatever it is, whatever those evil, wicked thoughts are that go through the human mind. So Jesus comes and you know who he spends time with? People like that. And he says, hey, if you're not offended by the crowd I roll with, then blessed are you, right? Because he came to do the work and the will of the Father. He says one more thing, John 10, starting with verse 37. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Now, Jesus is saying, hey, look, I am doing the will of God. The works that I am doing are the will of the Father. Not only did Jesus have miraculous power, and that is a wonderful thing. You know, the fact that he could open the eyes of the blind, that lepers were cleansed, that demons were cast out of people that were incurable and had been set aside and apart and removed distantly from the community with shame and condemnation. But these very people had their demons cast out of them so that they could be restored Restored to community and to fellowship with other people. So the miraculous, that's one element of the works of the Father that Jesus was doing. But the other element, if you want to know more about this, the fast that God desires, read Isaiah 58. What causes you to be pleasing in the sight of God, to be great in the sight of God? What causes your prayers to be heard on high? Read Isaiah 58. 
It's all of these things. Jesus is the supernatural example of the fullness of Isaiah 58. He didn't just walk a blind person down the road so they didn't fall in a pit or lose their way or go to the wrong place. No, he actually opened their eyes by the healing power of God. So Jesus took it to a whole new level, but all of it was within the context and the confines of doing the work of the Father. He humbled himself. Yes, he had supernatural miracle power, but he did not use and abuse that miracle power to usurp the will of other people, to force them to do what he wanted them to do. You know what that is? That's witchcraft. You know who does that? Sorcerers and witches and witch doctors. Jesus did not do that. Even in his use of spiritual power and authority, he was still submitted to the Father to do only the works of the Father and only the will of God.